Hello and welcome to Daily Politics on Trust TV. On this program, we discuss issues around politics, policy and governance. I am Shapiu Suleiman. Thank you very much for staying with us on Daily Politics. And today we're looking at uh, rejection of uh, President Muhammad Buhari's INEC nominees by civil society organization. Uh, some of them actually. Uh, in total, the president has submitted 19 names of uh, nominees. Uh, among them, uh, five, um, you know, are to have their appointments renewed, while uh, the other 14, you know, are fresh nominees. Uh, but then, <coughs> as usual, this time around, <laughs> you're able to pick five, not even one. <laughs> Uh, remember, you know, the Loretta Onuche saga, you know, which led to, um, you know, uh, a lot of face up between the civil society and the government officials. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Zewa. Um Why are you rejecting these nominees uh, for the appointment into resident electoral commissioner's position um, this time around? Well, I, I think the big the challenge for us is that um, election is governed by rules, regulations, and the constitution. Appointment into the electoral management body is also governed by same constitution, and in the constitution, it's clear who can be appointed and who should not be appointed. So it, once there is a violation of the constitution and considering the sanctity of the institution that we're referring to and its importance in the leadership recruitment process it's beholding on any self-respecting person not just people of civil society to undergird and protect that institution so it has nothing it's not about civil because there's a sense in which and i may keep making that point where people, you know, tend to just think that, oh, it's, it's um, an adversarial relationship mm -hmm. between the government and civil society. It's not so. Mm -hmm. The government itself, are the, they make these laws. So if, if they, I'm not sure it contemplated at any time that you can make appointments whimsically. So if those laws do not follow the due process, constitutional requirements, it behoves on us as watchers, keen watchers, and indeed for some of us as mm. investors, mm. people who have invested mm. quite a lot in the consolidation of this democracy to mm. stand up to uh, ensure that what is right is done. If we don't do so mm. at this point in time, we will be reversing the gains that has been made. We, we already know that there has been incremental progress since 2007, mm. you know, if you like. In, in the electoral process, the, the the beneficiary of that 2000 election says, "Oh, the election that brought me to power is flawed," mm -hmm. and went ahead to set up an always committee. committee. Mm -hmm. From that point, we've mm -hmm. been, you know, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So, if you get card carrying politicians, if you get um, alleged corrupt people, mm -hmm. if you bring people that do not meet the threshold mm -hmm. of integrity that the constitution. It requires for people who will go to that office. Okay. Then we, we okay. have responsibility. Yeah, before we, we talk about, you know, the yardstick or the measures or, you know, the parameters used to, uh, you know, detect this, this nominees, um, let me get your perspective. Um, I, I know that for appoint, um, appointments into offices, especially coming from the presidency, um, largely there is there are certain institutions or, you know, or organs of government that do bet or check, you know, or screen, so to speak. Uh, specifically, I know the Department of Secu State Security uh, does that, you know, at some point. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's part of the, its mandate now uh, to guide, if you like, or to, to assess, if you like, to bait this uh, nominees so that um, it also guides the president on the people he's appointing into offices. Um, d d d with this happening now, is it to say that that channel has not been followed or perhaps along the line there are, there are, there are issues? 
Um, I think we can only speculate at this point if it was followed mm. or not. Mm. Um, so it's possible it was followed and maybe the president decided to exercise his own powers to override it because that happened in the past. Uh, we have precedents for that even in this government where, for example, the former Nigerian uh, ambassador to the United States over above the objection of not just the state security service but also of the Senate, the president still appointed him. Um, so it's possible that happened. It's also possible that this wasn't noticed. We, we can't rule it out. Mm -hmm. So either way, I any of these things could have happened. But the bottom line is that it's still the, um, the box just about the president's desk because he makes those appointments um, or these nominations. And he has made these nominations and these are glaring um, faults or issues we can we can see. And when we say we, like uh, as everyone says, it's not just mm -hmm. civil society, it's Nigerian citizens. And to build up on the points you said, it's also, it also feeds into the perception people have of the election and whatever results come out of the election. And if you have um, election officials who are partisan, who have tainted past, no matter the results, it can be easily alluded to this past or this partisanship. And it's very, very important if you're going to have elections that are going to be, um, even for those who do not, whose candidates do not win, can still get behind and support the results, is, it, this is going to be an impediment to that happening. Yeah, okay. Before we talk about the timing, you know, perhaps some will say um, right from day one, perhaps the civil society would have alerted the government or they alerted the president or, you know, or raised concerns even before they get to this level of... Uh, you know, uh, nominated, been nominated by the president and so on. But I don't know how, you know, the procedure the civil society organizations use, um, or perhaps they have to wait until the names are released for them to go uh, and do the, 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 I mean, the checks and whatever. But let, let, me, let me come back to Mr. Ezenwa. Um, these are critical issues now, talking about two key, <laughs> strong, you know, um, objections, partisanship. Um, I understand, based on your observation, some of these nominees have had one or two issues to do with the ruling party, that is the APC, isn't it? Uh, one of them was said to be also a relative to uh, an APC chief ten or so, uh, one of the, the national leaders of the party. Um, but how does that align have, for instance, let's take that for a sp specific uh, uh, case study. How does that align her with the partisanship? I mean, the the, the affiliation of her uh, relative. Mark just made the point about perception, hmm. okay, and legitimacy issues. Because at the end of the day, it's about legitimacy. Hmm. You can be elected, you can even walk somewhere, but do the people truly believe that this institution hmm. that is called independent can serve that purpose? There is that challenge. Let me tell you, the singular interests that the governor of the CBN showed slightly. Mm. If you know the consequence, if you know what that has meant for INEC mm. in terms of credibility, just even putting materials. Mm. You saw what we went through in, in Ekiti and, and uh, Osho. So when you say, how does it affect? Mm. Take, for instance, somebody who is not just a member of the party who has been an aspirant mm. just as recently as 2014, 2015. Mm. And then you make that person a resident electoral commissioner. The, 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 what the governors are trying to inflict on our politics, mm. we will need to resist it. Mm. What the people, the, the political administrators, what they want to inflict, mm. this, this idea of continu continually wanting to constrict the, the space mm. is something we need to restrict. So it's not about if, you're, if, you're, if you are nominated mm. by a partisan person mm. and you're asking me how it affects, it, mm. it's automatically, the, 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 I think they say who, who pays the piper, mm. it dictates the tune. The, the appointer, there's a reason why he's appointing you. Mm. He's appointing you to, to, to hold a brief. Mm. And that brief is going to confer dubious advantage mm. on somebody. And once that happens, there is no longer level playing field. So the idea mm. is to ensure 
And you were asking Mark, uh, you know, whether the DSS and all of those people. Yeah, those uh, uh, in, in checks. checks yeah. we, we, the evidence abounds that those process can be over, over, you know, at any point in time. Those are not people. That's no longer. Not so, not she already gone to the 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 Senate for 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 clearance. Okay. Yeah. So if that process was followed. Any right-thinking person will have known that that kind of person shouldn't be nominated. And so, most times, the challenge is not what the political actors do. There are institutions also who have responsibility to do this check. Mm. And that institution is called the National Assembly. They have a power to reject. And we have, we have gone to them. We have petitioned them mm. and said the executive seems to have overlooked the constitution. You are the safeguard mm. or institutional safeguard mm. for this democracy is the legislature please ensure that you do not mm. but, but um, yeah is this deliberate because looking at the posture and uh, the the um, the standing of president Muhammad buhari for instance who is has been talking about living a legacy especially in the i mean uh, of, of transparent elections would you say that you know it, it was a deliberate act, a deliberate attempt, you know, to impose these people or to inject these people uh, for certain uh, reasons? For me, I, I think you can't take it away for, from the president. There's, there's quite some uh, good steps he's taking to bring that legacy, but there are also elements within the system who try to subvert that legacy. Whether he knows it or not, that's his business. I, I don't speak for him. But I think that I have a responsibility. Whoever and wherever there is an attempt to subvert the Constitution and impose a process that will confer dubious advantage on anyone in the system. Welcome back. This is Daily Politics on Trust TV. And let's now get to the discussion proper. Prof, you are welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> um, just yesterday, in Kano, mm. it was really a big event uh, where the uh, presidential flag bearer of the PDP, the national chairman, other members of the opposition People's Democratic Party went and uh, received Malen Ibrahim Shekaro, a former governor a former minister, a serving minister, I mean, a, a serving senator. What does that mean to the NNPP? Well, I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm happy to be with you, Hamza Idis, today. And uh, we have been meeting for a long time. Yeah. But I think this is the first time we are meeting. <laughs> one on one. <laughs> one on one on this project, <laughs> on this program. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you see, maybe you also did not look at what happened about two days earlier or three days earlier uh, when Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso, the presidential candidate of the New Nigeria People's Party, descended in Maiduguri. Yes. He went into Maiduguri at a time it was having a heavy rain all over the place. Mm. But because of his charisma, his character, his uh, acceptability as a leader in this country. People defied rain, defied all the obstacles, and went all over the way to receive him in a mammoth crowd unprecedented in the history of Borno politics. Mm. So for us, that's what matters most, that uh, we as a party, we are moving forward, we are advancing forward, and I do believe it because some of the political actors in the country are getting frightened or threatened about the, you know, the growing popularity of NNPP. That's why they have always been trying to push into us. Okay. But uh, you see, people take decisions every day mm. about their personal life and their political life. So if anybody who was part of us decide finally to leave, to go to another place, it will not stop the train moving. Mm. The 
the NMPP train is moving very fast and moving across the country. If you have look at what has happened, not only in Maiduguri, but when Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso went to Kaduna, when he went to, to Bauchi, when he went to Gombe, and uh, when he went to Kwara, in virtually all the states he went, you could see that there is something that is a phenomenon that is emerging. The Nigerians are standing up and rising up and saying that, yes, this is the time we are going to have a leader we can trust. Yeah, yeah. So that's what is important. But you see, Prop, if you look at Kano, mm. it's, it's really significant considering the um, you know, voting population in Kano. Um, then you, if you look at the strength of um, Malam Shekaro, the strength of um, Konkosu, if these two leaders can come together, it will send a big signal, I mean, to uh, other political parties. But now, within three months, most likely there must have been some underlying factors that led to this. Can you share some of them with us? No, I think uh, we as a party, we have taken a principal position that will not engage in unnecessary controversy over anybody who leave the party. Because as one leaves, yes. 10,000 others join the party on a daily basis. Mm. Therefore, we do have respect for the, the uh, Senator Ibrahim Shekarou. It is his decision. But I know that everybody who knows color, kind of politics also know that when you talk about Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso, Konkoso is Kano and Kano is Konkoso. Have you made some effort, most likely, to reconcile them as the national chairman? Like I said, I don't want to us to drag this matter beyond this point. Yeah. Uh -huh. Whatever happens has happened. Okay. Like I said, people take decision every day. Yeah about their personal life, about their family, about their politics. So if uh, uh, Shekaro felt that he is better off living in a senatorial seat, yeah. Yeah, because the NNPP offered him that senatorial seat, and uh, I am sure it is good to go on the day of election, he will just cross over, continue with where he is. But he, he feels that he is better to abandon that one and go to a, 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 a region of uncertainty, of <laughs> doubt, and that he feels is comfortable with that arrangement, so be it. But definitely, as you know, that uh, the, what we have been trying to do as much as possible is that we try to give respect to everybody, mm. we carry everybody, and that's why almost by the time he joined the NMPP, uh, very late in the day, but still he was given the due respect and then he should continue with his senatorial uh, position. And then maybe one or two things may not happen the way he liked, mm -hmm. but I think the overall interest of the country would have been more important now, not the personal issue anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, everybody knows the, the NMPP emerged largely because we are concerned about the future of our country. We are, we are worried that the current political parties that are been, you know, holding the country by the jugular over the past uh, 22 years, People are not comfortable with what is happening. And that's why we came and offered an alternative. And we believe this is the, 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 the most credible alternative you can have to, for now. So, uh, God is in charge. Then what happens to his ticket? It, I, because I believe uh, <coughs> viewers would like to know what you will do. Maybe the person you will hand over of equal... The good, the good thing is that, uh, you know, there was a new electoral act that has been signed into mm -hmm. law by Mr. President uh, 2022. You also know that INEC always comes out with its own guidelines for all kind of primaries and uh, congresses. And uh, we hope the Nigerian constitution, of course, we also have our own party constitution. We have our guideline for primaries and others. So we, are go we also have our lawyers. So we are also going to be guided by all these uh, uh, basic documents and our, uh, the counsel from our lawyers. I will take a decision what to do on that seat. But technically speaking, he has left that seat. And I thought if I were a close person to him, very mm -hmm. close, I wouldn't advise him to have done that. Why, but, bro? Well, I think it is a... I, I don't think... Uh, 
the, what is important in this country is that sometimes, you know, there are a few sacrifices you have to make for mm. the overall interest of the country. Yeah. Even if they hurt you. Besides, what is happening is that he has been accommodated by the party, he's been given his due respect. And I have personal respect with, uh, to him. And uh, he has a very good, good relationship with uh, Rabbi Musa Konko. So, so I thought whatever happened, he would have just, you know, move on. So I focus on the issue concerning our country today. Yes, you made mention of the fact that you are for Nigeria. He too, in his claims, said he is for Nigeria, he is for his people. Before he joined you, there were many agreements, but only his ticket was given to him, and uh, he felt uh, he can sacrifice that ticket for Nigeria. I think this is common denominator of uh, politicians. Uh, wouldn't you have extended more avatars to him in terms of accommodating some of his candidates, going by the fact that he stands to bring in more to the table? Maybe, uh, Lord Hamza, maybe you, you, there's something you know better than me. <laughs> 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 On this matter, I know that uh, we don't. You want, did your best. We, we don't want to join issues. Okay. Uh, NNPP is moving on, is moving forward, is moving strong, and uh, I have repeatedly said it that uh, those who take NNPP for granted will be surprised. At their own peril. You, you are making some penetration in states close to Kano, maybe let's say Jigawa, Kazina, you even jumped to the northeast. You went to Borno. You started saying something on that. Um, what are your chances in Borno, for instance? Well, yeah, the language you use is like you say, we started in Kano, moving to Jigawa, and jump into uh, Maiduguri or Borno, as if we, Borno is not part of Nigeria. I, you see, this, this uh, NNPP is a national movement, mm -hmm. and uh, it is having spontaneous evolution and uh, advancement. It is not uh, something that is just done, you know, uh, as if there is no plan, no organization, no, everything is done in a very systematic manner. And uh, what is happening is that every state in Nigeria is very important to us. Mm. And uh, so far as you are aware, uh, technically the campaign for 2023 has not started. Yeah. So what has been done is more or less explanatory, uh, explanatory uh, visits, uh, contact visits, uh, to reach out to stakeholders, greet them, open offices, and uh, let them know that they have friends uh, and uh, people who care for them. And uh, you just don't have to wait until the day for campaign start, then we are now asking for votes. No, in advance, we must go and show concern and uh, re-engage re the various communities in the country. So he's been moving around the country throughout. And like I mentioned, everywhere he goes, everywhere the train goes, the reception is unprecedented. The, the, the gathering in Borno, it was so big that some people started asking questions whether you jumped the, the, the gun and started campaigning. Uh, what did you use? What magic wand did you deploy to mobilize the people? Sir, we have already said this. I want to repeat it. That yes. People are tired of APC. They are tired of PDP. They are tired of what they represent. We have also said that we have passed the face, pace or face of now uh, shouting and crying. We are now at the face of looking for solutions to our problems. So therefore, Nigerians now are getting much more aware mm. eh? yes. about what affects, it's affecting them daily. Ah, welcome back. Thank you very much. Good. Uh -huh. You can see it, Nigeria and Brentford. <laughs> yes, maybe I should start with you, Mr. Emmanuel. 19.64% inflation, but these are technical figures. Now in local parlance, how will you explain this? Inflation in July, 19.64%.
Well, how, how I will explain is very, very simple. I think uh, the previous month it was lower. We just saw a 2% rise in the inflation rate. It's uh, quite unfortunate. And when you look at the rates, it's, uh, the impact is still on, based on the fact that there are many factors to be considered. We are having like uh, food prices are going up. Food prices went up by 50%. We're having a porous uh, security. We're having failing infrastructure. All these factors help, and also high unemployment rates. I mean, the educational system, students are on strike. All these are factors that when you put together, of course, there's no way a, a, a country can actually function properly when all these different sectors are not really functioning, so are not really functioning very well. Uh, that's why we are having a very high inflation rate. Uh, it is quite unfortunate that uh, it was supposed to, we are supposed to see a decline, but we are seeing an increment, you know, from mm -hmm. the previous month to this present month, which is not really good. And this is the time for, I think that uh, we have, we need a strong economist to actually come and put in some things in place because it's not really helping us. When, when, when uh, is actually everybody is affected. Food prices, you can't even go to the market right now. The prices of food uh, yesterday is not the same as what we have today. Everything is virtually going up in prices. And that's what, what is causing this inflation rate mm. to keep going up, which mm. is not good yeah. for the economy. Yeah. It's not. I can tell you that. Okay. Marlon Jamilu, what is your take on these uh, figures uh, uh, released by uh, the NBS? Um, I think uh, the figures can be viewed in... Uh, two different spheres. Okay. Uh, sphere number one is a global thing. Okay. Uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, for instance, the price of uh, gold in the international market was about 600, 700 uh, dollars per ounce. Mm. Today, gold is 1,800 dollars per ounce. So, you cannot say or you cannot exclude Nigeria from the global trend of that inflation. Those figures of gold sold in the market also must reflect on our own economy. Now, what we need is how do we differentiate or how do we calculate the difference between the global inflation and our own local inflation. Mm. Then we now come back and look at our own local inflation. You see, if you look at that one, it's about 300 uh, percent. The global the global figure. index, yeah. the global figure mm. is about 300 yes. percent. Okay. If you come back to Nigeria, the last time we had single-digit inflation was ages uh, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Now. Uh, 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 possibly uh, the trend, we would say in the mid-1990s, the trend was a bit slower because I remember between 1991 to around 1997-98, there was just about 3-4% uh, inflation. Mm. But today, it's almost on a monthly basis. Uh, these things, are, uh, you can look at them from uh, not only from our socio-economic point of view, mm -hmm. you also look at them from our political point of view. There's great political instability, and these things are definitely impacting on what the inflation is. Yeah. Um, you see, local man on, on the street, he keeps crying that, okay, I bought a loaf of bread in January, let's say 300 naira. But now it is 600 naira. He tends to really be in difficult situation to understand that is it just the cost of flour or, or, or what? What is your take on this? Because there is a wide gap. The locals are not being uh, given clearer picture of what is really happening. Yeah, if you, if you check what is happening, for instance, for the the locals that don't really understand. But I can tell you, when you also go to some uh, rural parts of Nigeria, they also understand because of these porous insecurity, security issues we're having. Most of these food have been produced in the rural areas, mm -hmm. and where, if you look at it, people can't even go to the farm right now because mm -hmm. of uh, bandits 
and there are a, a lot of uh, insurgency that is happening. And all these are impacts, is actually impacting on us. Like, like for instance, I was discussing with uh, a farmer mm. last two weeks, and he told me that he has never, he has not been to the farm for three months. Three months? Three months right now. Because he can't go to the farm. He lives around Abuja? No, not in Abuja. Okay. He can't go to the farm in Zampara, for instance. The reason is because of banditry. Mm. And now, most of these states in the rural, uh, most of these states are actually the food producers yeah. that feeds the country. Mm. I'm not talking about uh, most of these foods that have been imported into Nigeria that is affecting other things we do. We're talking about the local things that we sell here. Mm. They can't go to the farm and they can't produce. And there's a, when there's a shortage, in food supply, what I mean, the prices will go high for the limited ones we have. Mm -hmm. So right now, like what he explained, prices are going up. And when you meet most of these guys in the rural, they actually understand a little bit because they are also experiencing this high, high rate of insecurity. Yeah. And it's affecting everybody. That is even local. Now, when you also talk about foreign, some of the things that are being imported into Nigeria, we can't even do that right now mm -hmm. because of the war going on. You know, we, we, we used to import most of the wheat from Ukraine, yeah. but we can't do that right now because mm -hmm. of the war. Mm -hmm. So all this is going to lead to, even the ones that can be imported are limited. Yeah. All this leads to increase in mm -hmm. prices of what we have available. Okay. And these are what contributes to this inflation rise. Okay. Maybe we, let's uh, talk to Dr. Dipel. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Dr. Dipel? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Good. Now, you, you live in the UK. Uh, how can you put the inflation figures there vis-a-vis -vis how you are monitoring it in Nigeria? Well, as far as I can know, this is the first time in my lifetime to have seen the UK comparing itself in inflation numbers with Nigeria. Previously, before the war and the pandemic, once the UK inflation rate exceeds 2%, the CBN governor will be called to question by the parliament. The central bank governor will be called to question by the parliament to explain what and how that can be addressed. But now the inflation is triggered by factors outside of the control of the state and they have to buy the bullet uh, as time being. Now, they project that their inflation rate will be roughly 18% plus by next year, and that's roughly what Nigeria's inflation rate around that. So these countries are experiencing inflation, but the factors at the roots of these inflations, they differ, and that's why the policies to address them will also differ. Yeah. Good. Jamilu, um, in July 2022, the World Bank um, listed Nigeria among 10 top countries with highest inflation. What is the implication of this on the economy? The implication is wide uh, ranging. Uh, one, uh, it will dampen our capacity for uh, production and export, export production, not even for local uh, uh, consumption. Uh, two, even our, it, it will even affect our credit rating, our mm -hmm. international credit rating, which is very, very important uh, as far as uh, uh, the global economic community is uh, are concerned. So by that, it means uh, as a borrowing country, uh, our uh, limit to borrowing will be increased mm -hmm. instead of uh, decreased. Uh, someone will try to say, okay, why do we always want to borrow? See, yes. the, 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 that is the structure of the global economy. That's how the global economy has been structured. Uh, borrowing is a mainstream item okay. in the global economy. So it only depends on your borrowing capacity, your credit rating, and so on. So now, if we have to class countries according to their own uh, uh, economic capacity. Mm. Now, you have to look at uh, these factors such as inflation. Mm. So if uh, 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 the World Bank or any, of, uh, any such institution 
is rating us at that. Mm. It means our own economic capacity is also decreasing. Mm. So what we now need to do is sit down as a country, look at uh, all uh, our economic inputs, mm. then try to uh, look at where things are going wrong. Unfortunately, uh, the, the, the main items there are structural. Okay. Yes. Structural in, the, in what sense? You see, okay, uh, let me uh, give you an, uh, a basic example. Mm. If we are talking about uh, 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 inflation, yes. not only on uh, uh, market goods, mm. Mm? okay, the Naira itself is highly inflated okay. today, or mm. inflation has affected the Naira adversely. Mm. Now, the structure there is, it's a simple uh, economic uh, uh, give and take. Yeah. Now, how do you get the dollar? Mm. You have to sell, you have to produce. Yeah. Produce and then export then get your dollar. Mm. It means if you are not producing to export, you won't be getting dollar. Mm. And the lesser dollar you have, mm, mm. the higher the price would be. Thank you very much uh, for staying with us on Daily Politics. <clears throat> and just like I said earlier, we have in the studio former Minister of Communica uh, Communication, uh, Debaya Shitu, uh, with an APC chieftain and of course uh, will be joining us to discuss uh, 2023 and whether the APC can retain its mandate. Thank you very much once again for joining us, uh, Minister. It's my pleasure. <coughs> right, okay, Let, let's go straight into this uh, conversation. Uh, it's less than 28 days, precisely 27 days to the lifting of ban, you know, uh, on political campaigns across the country. And our politicians are already strategizing, as we can see. Um, the Southwest, you know, is one battleground, some would say, looking at, you know, <laughs> the, the config, political configuration right now. Uh, even though some will say because of the emergence of uh, uh, Senator Bola Metunubu, the Southwest might be, uh, you know, I mean, in the kitty for APC. But there are also concerns that uh, it might be, it might not be, you know, a smooth <laughs> sail. What would you say with regards to the Southwest? Is it going to be a hundred percent, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in the kitty for the APC? Let me tell you straight away and mm. sincerely, for that matter, mm. that our target is to get eighty percent of the votes mm. in the Southwest. And this target is very realistic, having regard to the fact that mm -hmm. the, the love which our people have for our principal, as well as Ahmed Tinubu, mm -hmm. is akin to the almost fanatical support the, that they had given to the late Chief M.K. Abiola. Mm -hmm. One may say, but there are certain states where there are, you know, PDPs in control. Mm -hmm. But if you ask the average electorate mm -hmm. in those states, they will tell you for president, mm -hmm. for presidential election, it is Bola Ahmed Tinubu all the way. But, but then some would say charity begins at home, for instance. Uh, recently, we had one of the spokespersons of the, AP, uh, the PDP, you know, uh, who did use that analogy. He said, they defeated your principal, you know, fairly and squarely in his well. home state, talking about Oshun. <laughs> well, so, so if, if he can be defeated in Oshun, they, which they is in home state, including were, his ancestral home. Yeah, look, look, there were local problems, which uh, uh, is uh, related to the governor there. I'm saying this with all due respect to him. I try to mediate along the line between him mm -hmm. and some people at the grassroots. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Perhaps there was a kind of overconfidence and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was it. But I want to tell you, you can do your very independent uh, investigation among the 
people in the Southwest, whether in Noshon or, or your state or, you know, Lagos or Ogun State or Ekiti Anundo. You know, and I want this to be put on record that I, you know, forecasted that we will have about 80% of the votes of our people. You see, his emergence has actually done more than assuaging a lot of feelings. Time was when agitation for the so-called Yoruba nation mm. was very top and uh, it was spreading like fire. But nobody's talking about that anymore mm. because they feel that once uh, Asiwaju, having regard to his pedigree and what he represents mm. as about the best in Yoruba land today, I mean, there's no reason why agitation for a Yoruba nation should uh, continue. But what, what, is it about ethnic affiliation? For it is. Instance? Because I don't. The know point that. is, you see, that's... you see, we are not all the same human beings. Yes. You know, people have different perspectives. People have different approaches. Mm -hmm. I, as a person, have always both said that I'm not supporting Asiwaju because he's a Yoruba man. Neither am I supporting him because he's a Muslim, mm -hmm. but because he's the best that Nigeria deserves. At this point in time. Yeah, but, but beyond that, you know, the point I'm driving at is this. Even within the Yoruba nation, as you, as you said, for instance, we've seen very strong voices, like that of Apeni Perry, for instance, which is led <laughs> by the uh, Chipadi Adebayo. Well, and, and of course, <laughs> you know, tilting towards uh, an OB candidate, Look, candidate tell so me, to speak. With due respect then, to all the elders in our friend mm. friends, so called our friend friends. Tell me one election that they have won in the last 20 years. Either that of a member of the House of Assembly, or that of House of Rep, or that of a Senate, or governorship. Are you saying that their voices are not loud enough? They may be loud. I mean, it's, it's not the loudness in a voice, you know, that determines electoral votes. If they are, they, there's so much substance hmm. in the, what you describe as the loudness, hmm. They should be able to boast of in a particular state where they can say, we made this happen hmm. for party A or party B or party B. But that does not exist. Hmm. But then understanding their uh, disposition is that, you know, uh, the Southwest has been at it, you know. Uh, Obasanjo was there for eight years and so on. And it's about time for the Southeast, for instance, who hasn't been uh, This thing thrown. is not granted a la carte. Hmm. It's not granted. I mean, they, in any case, there's an Igbo man who is also contesting on the platform of labor. There's a Yoruba man who is contesting only, I mean, not because he's a Yoruba man, but because he's the best that APC, in its wisdom, can offer if we want to, you know, win the presidential election in 2023. Mm. And you will agree with me that the combination, as far as Rajbola and Metinubu, mm. and that of uh, Shetima is really ma an electoral masterstroke, hmm. which made a lot of people start making all the noise about you know you know baseless hmm. complaints. But you yeah. are also very much aware of uh, some of the concerns. For instance, you are saying it's about the best you know in the southwest. Yes, yes, yes. But we knew that you know during the presidential primary of the APC, there is also the current vice president you know who aspire. Uh, you know, the to, to pick the ticket, we, we, uh, and you know, in terms of energy, <laughs> what, in what terms of uh, you they know, uh, what uh, are, uh, they, uh, are they done the competition in in uh, assessing energy between them to know who has much more it, energy? Even age-wise, you you can be it's able to say bad. you could be uh, you could. Let me tell you, mm. time was when uh, the current president was sick, and a lot of people, you know, took him for the dead. Today, I can assure you, he's stronger than you and I. You mean Ashwa Jabulan? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm talking about being President Muhammad Buhari. Mm. Today is as strong. He doesn't use walking stick. He's not aided in walking. Mm. So is Ashwa Tinubu. And uh, I mean, you can imagine the difference in age mm. between Tio Ashwa Tinubu, Tinubu, and uh, President Muhammad Buhari. Mm. So it's not about age. It is about it. And this is, I mean, I dare say also that to be a president. It's not about labor. <laughs> it's not about physical labor. But we know what pre what physical presence would also do in no, terms of, course, of there's governance. Nothing, there's nothing to... Your presence will, will be required, you know, at certain nothing, positions. There's nothing to 
distract or detract from the fact that Aswaji Timu is as healthy and as strong as anybody other person around. Mm. You know, I mean, if you are a, a Jack, Mr. Jack, mm. or you are whatever, I mean, the, the, I mean, is that all that the presidency requires by way of qualification? Mm. You need sound education, you need experience, you need exposure, you need dynamism. Mm. Of course, you also need good health. And we are happy to say that. You're pretty Aswaji, sure, you know, his, his present health condition what is the health condition we'll, if, you we'll sustain, wish, you know. if you wish to tell us? Uh, because, you know, we are going towards a very rigorous, uh, I mean, no, no. campaign. This time around, it's even six months, you know, uh, straight, yes, so to speak. Yes, yes. Uh, it requires what, a lot What of gives the impression that, mm. look, Atiku is 76 or thereabout. Mm. Atiku is about, six, you know, six years mm. older than us. Why do the people not complain about Atiku's age? I mean, it's a question of when you see that you have somebody, an mm. opponent, who has, you know, greater advantage than you, you want to paint him, you know, red or paint him black, you know, living merit, living substance, you know. So there's no question about, you know, the health of Bola Ametinubu, I can assure you. Okay, now going back to the trajectory, you know, you were talking about the fact that, you know, the Southwest is already, um, you know, in support of your... Principal. Not only the South. <laughs> let, let, let's let's, let's look at the South. I'm challenge a lot of people that. Mm. Because, yes, the reason why I'm asking okay. this question, you know, a number of people made up the Southwest, not just the Yorubas, for <laughs> instance. Uh, if you look at religious demography, again, also, yeah. it, it plays a role. Mm. And then uh, take, for instance, in Lagos. Yeah. We know that a substantial number of, uh, you know, other indigents, uh, I mean, of Nigeria, including Igbos, for instance, substantial number. Mm -hmm. And then there is also this concern about the raging uh, youth, you know, enthusiasm mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the press, uh, the, the candidate of Peter Obi. It uh, doesn't doesn't that worry you? Not at all. Not uh, at all. You look, charity must begin at home. Mm -hmm. What legacy has Peter Obi left for the people of Anambra? which will make even the average Igbo endeared to him. But you said the record is there for him which, which to speak record? for him in a number of Which states. record? He left, you know, a, a, a huge amount of money after leaving the... He left the, 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 the money the, the he had corpus, invested the in the, of the, state. the government, money that, that is, the government mm. money that he had invested in his private company. Is that what you are talking of? Could that be an advantage? I mean, if you talk of somebody leaving money, was he supposed to leave money? Is he a banker or is he a bank? But, but was is, the money is, for is, Isn't that showing some level of prudence, you know, what and, is the prudence? and transparency? Go, look, it, go, going to government is about going to perform for the benefit of the people, not going to keep the people's money, the people's money which he was, you know, using for his own business purposes. And you see that is an advantage. Uh, are that you saying that there is advantage. no performance to show? Well, for yeah, I mean, if you know, please let us know. The people of Anambra are saying there's no legacy project mm -hmm. that this Peter of Ubi of Ima had left in Anambra. Mm -hmm. And ever since he's been going around to campaign, have you heard him list any achievements apart from saying that he left some money, which is even being dis disputed? I mean, is he, is he a money keeper? Or is somebody who ought to go and use the monies to develop education, to develop infrastructure, to build roads and bridges, and to take care of the health care of, of the people there? I mean, we should get a bearing, right? We should get, you know, the priorities right. Welcome back. This is Daily Politics on Trust TV, and let's now get to the discussions proper. Doctor, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, so many things happened today in Nigeria. Right. Precisely in Plateau State, for instance. Yes. The um, election petition tribunal sacked Musa Aga uh, representing just not Basa federal constituency in the House of Representatives. And surprisingly, announced uh, Adam uh, London as the validly elected member representing that um, uh, zone in the House of Representatives under the platform of People's Redemption Party, PRP. PRP. Yes, is it surprising to you? Well, uh, let's say one should not be too surprised. One should be delighted that uh, small parties 
looking at uh, old ideologies are beginning to have some input into the electoral process or into the democratic process. I think this is the first uh, member of the National Assembly that PRP <laughs> has. Uh, sometimes some uh, politicians get into these parties just for the purpose of gaining an electoral seat and they come immediately after. Mm. But uh, from all indications, it is, there is some indications that uh, this one is a properly bred PRP representative. Okay. And I think I would say I would congratulate PRP for this. And it is the beginning probably they would be able to make more impact in their polity. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the plateau state politics is also something of note because I, uh, it, uh, there it seems to have been effort or some elite mm. connivance to deny the presence of certain people or languages or tribes existence or recognition within Plateau State. Mm. And I think this candidate comes from that section where some elite in Plateau State would not want to accept uh, indigenous to Plateau State. Mm. I think it's an advancement in our politics. We have to come to learn to live with the fact that you can represent any part of this country as a citizen of this country. I think there are some Igbo representatives in Lagos, yeah. you know, and uh, there used to be, Nigeria started with that cohabition, mm -hmm. with their unity. The Europeans did not bring interrelationship between us as units and tribes. They came and met it and even to a large extent adulterated some of it, created divide and rule in order for them to continue. Mm -hmm. The relationship between people of we call southern Nigeria and northern Nigeria that the British created as north and south mm. existed long before we ever knew who the British were. Yeah. You know? So I think uh, we're coming to terms with the fact that people could be in a place. I'm mm. expecting probably very soon you have Yoruba uh, representatives from Kanu, Sabungiri, and other places. Winning elections. Winning elections. Because now the, the numbers are there to yes, win the elections. The, the plateau issue, you know, it was a by election conducted in. February. February, yes. Yes. Now, the tribunal uh, cited um, illegality in the ruling People's Democratic, uh, I mean, yeah, PDP, yes. uh, in nominating the, the candidate. Uh, what does this signify? Because many elections and primaries have been conducted. Now, there is a message from Plato. What is your take? Well, on uh, I don't know the real nitty gritty whether there was a candidate that the PDP discarded. In order no, to they present had, yes, they had uh, factions. Factions, yeah, they yes. had factions. And so the other it. faction was discarded for a person that was not validly yeah. nominated. That mm -hmm. is one aspect. The, the most interesting aspect is about the votes casted that the tribunal looked at mm -hmm. and found out that there were over votings in so many places. Yes. Elements of rigging. To give over, advantage. To give advantage. Mm -hmm. So now that the tribunal has taken away that advantage and with the new modification in the electoral law, Mm. We might expect that real figures will begin to show representing real people where they reside and therefore we'll begin to see representations that are not what some of the elite of certain areas uh, really are happy with, but they cannot do away with mm. all over the country, I hope. Yeah, still on, on plateau because there are real issues happening. The a court today, you know, cleared former Governor Jonah Jang of all wrongdoings. He was taken to court for massively, allegedly looting uh, state resources. But today, he has been cleared of all the allegations. Uh, what is your take? <laughs> well, I don't know. Probably the judiciary is getting frustrated with the fact that after a long process of ju <laughs> adjudication, somebody can even be pardoned at the end of the day. So like the idea they, of the same plateau and to Inyan, pardon yeah. him <laughs> in their own way. But uh, I don't know, I don't know, uh, I wouldn't want to now make a judgment against him since he has been cleared. But uh, I think uh, we need to be at least more serious about these things. We mm. see what these people do mm. and uh, escaping the dragnet the way many of them do will not help the system. But, but you see, doctor, uh, most Judges, when issues like this can, at the end of the day, you see issues of uh, um, lack of diligent prosecution. prosecution. Actually, investigation. Okay. 
Okay. Many of the times you don't blame the judges. Some of the cases are deliberately killed by the prosecutors themselves. Mm. Because that is the best way to get somebody off the hook. To present evidence that can be thrown out. Mm. And it's a very old method. Sometimes the issue is so strong that there is no way you can tell the public that this one can go free. Mm. So you arrest, you investigate, and you begin prosecution where you provide data or information that cannot stand. Mm. And in the end of the day, the person escapes. Yeah. Escapes not only that judgment, but any further investigation because he cannot be charged again on those issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so sometimes these things happen, and uh, judges have a lot of times complained about the fact that prosecutors do not break on with diligently investigated cases. Yeah. They make more noise in the media mm. than they do in the courts. Sometimes you see a case of, they will tell you, 600 billion mm. missing. But by the time you go into the nitty gritty of the case, maybe it was 600 billion budgeted. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, some of it was taken, but they would take the budgeted issue and make a case against somebody. Yeah. But by the time a judge starts coming through, you would see that what they are saying is quite not what is in the media. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, in Excel, uh, Nigeria, you know, has entered critical stages in terms of uh, electioneering this month. This month. Yesterday. yesterday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Mahmoud Yakubu at um, uh, a forum said that um, beginning from now, it's like we have entered uh, critical stage. For instance, the issue of presidential candidates, you know, the names and all that on 28th, that of governorship on the 4th, and then campaign in public by political parties. Officially commences on uh, September 28th, as provided by Section 94, Subsection 1 of the Electoral Act. Um, what is your understanding of getting <laughs> into critical stage. Critical stage. Let me start by saying that I personally take exception okay. to the manner in which INEC dramatizes <laughs> this political process, this process of getting an election, mm. to the extent that the society, the people, ignore important things mm. and continue to just go through a drama like it's a party, like it's a, it's, it's a convention of uh, uh, very making. Mm. You know, these are natural things in a democracy. Okay. The fact that INEC is taking about one and a half years mm. of creating a timetable and making, in fact, uh, I, I suspect yeah. that it might be deliberate. Because how could INEC be just so media frenzy, you know, hyping up every activity just because it's an election that is going to come? I know the interest of uh, uh, the contestants mm. and the fact that there is benefit mm. it, it, once they win offices, yeah. it's also high. But I think INEC should be the last body that should be hyping up this issue to the extent that you rather listen to INEC <laughs> than listen to the presidential speech. You know, we yeah. are waiting for this step by step and we are losing time and our economy is collapsing and nobody is listening. Yeah. Even when you talk about the real issues, people are more interested in that jamboree. Yes, I wanted to, they to go there. Because they are the election into jamborees. Yes, but the, the issue, of course, it is said that um, this is the longest um, election transition, transition yes. in, the, in the history of Nigeria. Yes.